So, we, are, we started a series last week in the book of Ephesians, and we're calling it United. And uh, I don't, how many guys, I can't see you, can you, get, can you raise the lights up for us? How many of you guys started a group this week? Raise your hand. Oh, hey, th- hey there you are. Man, I need, I need to see more hands, more hands. Who all was in? Good, 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 good. So here's the thing, here's what's, what's just so important for us to be in a group so we can actually have some community together, so we can actually worship the Lord, we can, we can just dive into His Word together. And, and so uh, some of the groups are, are just talking about what we're discussing here on Sunday mornings through the book of Ephesians. And, and today we're going to be d- discussing chapter 2 of the book of Ephesians. But before we get into that, a couple things I want to just remind you of. Uh, we've got Women's Connect. Where are my ladies at? Can we get a, get a what, what? Whoop. Okay, that's good. Friday, October 13th at 6 p.m. Write that down. Mark your calendars for that. It's going to be a great time together just as ladies getting, getting to connect with one another and actually get to spend some time with my wife, with Jana. She's not here today. She's a little under the weather, so she's decided to stay home today. But uh, be in prayer for her. She had a little fever yesterday, and so she's like, you know what? I'm just going to stay home and rest. Um, also, yesterday we had Serve the House. We, had, we started scrubbing down all kinds of things uh, all over the place, making everything really nice and clean and, and pretty and stuff. And so we've got one more Serve Day that's coming up this Saturday. And for, you, for those of you that have some time, and, and uh, just come in and help us out and just serve the house. I think it's going to be awesome. 9 to 2 p.m. And uh, there's something for everybody, even for the littles. And so I want, I want to make sure that you guys are aware of that. Also, just as a reminder, we do have giving at the end of service. And we have giving boxes that are at all of their entrances. Thank you for your faithfulness in giving. Prepare your heart now before you leave. Prepare your heart now. And I know this is hard sometimes to prepare your heart now to be generous. But you know what? If we plan ahead for generosity, it just kind of flows out of us. And there's something for for you that the Lord has, and I believe that he wants to bless you in that. Again, this isn't just about the money aspect. And I know, you know, we're all friends here. And I know sometimes it's hard to hear the pastor talk about finances and money, but I tell you what, the Bible talks about money and resources more than anything else. So I think there's something we should pay attention to in that. There's something for us as if we are faithful in that area. So last week, we started this series in the book of Ephesians, and just kind of as a recap, we talked about what it meant to be in Him. And this is a recurring theme that Paul has for all of us to understand. These are foundational truths for us to understand as we walk with the Lord. You see, sometimes we get to a place of salvation and we think, hey, I, I got saved and so I, met, I, I made my goal or, or I, I got to the place where I needed to be at salvation and, and we need to learn what goes beyond salvation. There are elementary things that lead us to salvation, but really this is the first day of the rest of your life. Salvation is day one, and so I want us to make sure that we have some tools, some knowledge about what the Bible says about who we are in Christ, what we are supposed to do, how we're supposed to act, all those kind of things. And the book of Ephesians is a great one for us to understand who we are. And so last week, I talked about what it means to be in Him. In Him, we are redeemed. We are purchased with a price. In Him, we have an eternal inheritance, meaning that if we are in Christ, we actually get to go to heaven and spend eternity with Him. Man, that is, that is our hope. More than anything, is that when we leave this earth, when our dirt suit expires, that we get to actually go and meet our Maker and spend some time with Him. So, well, I say some time. Spend eternity with Him in heaven. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, that would be a whole lot better, right? And then what makes the whole thing awesome 
is that the Holy Spirit seals us. He puts his seal of approval on us when we say yes to Jesus, when we commit our life to the Lord, when we make him Lord of our life, the Holy Spirit is the one that seals all of it. He legitimizes our salvation, which is a really awesome, awesome thing. And so today we're going to continue with these foundational truths about who we are in Christ. And part of that is understanding who we are is our identity. And, you know, I feel like the world today has this identity crisis. I don't know if you guys ever turn on the news, go on social media, go to downtown Seattle, whatever. There, there is truly some confusion of who people are in their identity. And part of that is a misunderstanding of what the Word of God says who we are. And I want us to understand beyond a shadow of a doubt who we are in Christ because then there's no question as to what our identity is or where our identity lies. Are you with me today? So here's what happens. Sometimes we are, our identity becomes shaped by external things, right? Our parents have an influence on our identity. Our friends, our education, our nationality, our heritage, our race. There are many things that shape our identity and who we are. But let's not confuse identity with activity because here's what happens is many times our activity determines what our identity is in our own mind. Think about this. Well, I'm a pastor. And I could say, because I'm a pastor, that my identity is shaped by what I do. I'm a fireman. I'm a policeman. I'm a lawyer. I'm a janitor. I'm a school teacher. And so our, our identity becomes shaped by our environment, by the actions that we take. But here's what happens when we equate identity with activity. Our identity it hinges on the success of our activity. If I'm a success or if I'm a failure, my identity takes up either a pat on the back or a swift kick in the rear. Think about this. If I'm successful in life and I've wrapped up my identity in that, there's, we're proud of ourselves, right? But if I'm unsuccessful in my activity, then our identity takes a shot. And so failure of our activity doesn't equate or equal failure of our identity. Identity is something that many people struggle with. And the reason people struggle with it is because in many instances, they're trying to be something or someone that someone else wants them to be rather than realizing where identity should actually come from. This is a hard subject in today's climate because there are influences in the world today that are pushing agendas, that are pushing ideologies, that are pushing wrong thinking and it's really what it comes down to is kind of this mob mindset. All of these other people are trying to push us in this direction. And if we don't know who we are, we'll just kind of go along with them. This is the plight that we're in today. And this is the fight that the church needs to be in. I was talking with one of our elders this past week. And there are some challenges that are going on with identity in some of the in the school that they're a part of. And a big part of the reason why there is a struggle in this area is because there are people that are part of the system that don't know who they are in Christ. See, when we're firmly rooted in who we are in Christ, then all of these other peripheral things take on a different 
perspective. But I believe as the church, we need to take a stand for our children. I mean, more than any, anything right now, this is our, the, the world is attacking our children when it comes to identity. And so it's going to take us parents to be the primary influencers, not the world influencing our children of who they are and who they are in Christ. Our responsibility is to pour into the next generation and being the example of who you are in Christ so then they can see who they are supposed to be in Christ. Are you tracking with me? Okay. Again, this is a, this, and we're not going to dive into that. We're going we're to save that for another time, but this is the plight that we're in. But the Word of God helps us understand and navigate this very topic. So Paul states in him 216 times in his letters. I think he's trying to tell us something. That our identity and who we are is rooted and founded in Christ. There's no other way, there's no other avenue, there's no other way to describe our identity outside of being in him. And so the key to our identity is found in him. So we didn't start out this way, though. We started out being in ourself. And look where being in ourself has got us. Think about where we are, the climate that we're in of being in ourself. It's about, well, I'll just say it's about selfishness. It's self-help, self-love. And see, the, the, the kingdom of God, the, the currency of the kingdom of God is the exact opposite of self. It's about him, not us. But the world makes it all about us. So to understand where we started in ourself, we have to understand that it, that it is by our very nature to be that way, and it goes all the way back to the very beginning. To the original sin of being in Adam. If we are in Adam, that means we are in ourself. If we are in Christ, it means that we are in Adam part two. Second Adam that is in Christ Jesus. See, we're all born into Adam, and that means that our nature is actually not of the Lord. It means that because of his sin, because of Adam's sin, we take on his sinful nature. And the deci our decision that he made, or uh, what, the one decision that he made, ruined everything for mankind until Jesus came on the scene. Paul describes it like this in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, For as by a man came death, this is talking about Adam, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead, who is Jesus. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. This is a key principle as believers. I was thinking about foundational truths. And there was a basketball player, some of you may have heard of him. He's, he's no longer with us, but he was very well known. His name was Kobe Bryant. Anybody ever hear him? You know, he was just kind of a, he was an okay basketball player for the Lakers. Some would compare him to another okay guy by the name of Michael Jordan. I'm just seeing if you guys are paying attention here. Kobe Bryant had this ability. He had an amazing, amazing talent. I mean, he was, even in high school, he was a man among boys. He was an amazing basketball player. 
But there came a point in his career that he realized that talent was only going to get him so far. So he began to do this routine every single day for the duration of his career of going through fundamental plays. He would shoot thousands of free throws. He would shoot thousands of three-pointers. He would shoot thousands of, of difficult shots, thousands of routine shots. Thousands, every single day, every single, I watched this video one time of this reporter, and he's like, hey, I want to I wanna just spend a little time with you, and, and so what does that look like? He goes, well, just meet me at the gym at 4.30. And he's like, oh, in the morning? <laughs> and so he gets there at 4.30 in the morning, and Kobe, has already, he's already up, worked up a sweat. He's already been working out. He's already been at it for probably an, an hour before he got there. And one of the things that he's always said, he's like, no one is going to outwork me. You see, this is what made him so great. It wasn't practicing the difficult shots. It was practicing the basic fundamental shots. Free throws, three-pointers, jump shots, layups, dribbling with the, the right hand, dribbling with the left hand going up and down the court, basic things. This is what made him great. For us as believers, this is an awesome example, is that we've got to be great at the fundamentals of our faith. You see, if we're not great at the fundamentals of our faith, when the mob comes and when people who have a deeper conviction of something that is totally against the Bible, something that, that we, we will then become swayed because we're not fundamentally sound. If we are here as a church to equip the saints, which you, if you call yourself a follower of Christ, you are the saints. If we are called to equip you, we're going to have to talk about the fundamental things of our faith. If we don't talk about the fundamental things of our faith, then we're going to begin to flounder. We're going to begin to stumble. We're going to begin to question some things about who we are because we just don't know. So we have to know that we know that we know who we are. These are the fundamental things for us. And so if you're taking notes, here is the fundamental principle that we find in chapter 2. It says this in verse 1 of chapter 2. It says, And you he made alive. Whew. You who are dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. Man, this right here is just a very good, clear explanation of where we are today. If you look at the world out there, they are dead in their sin because of what they have done. They walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air. That's talking about Satan himself. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. And so we have to understand who we are before Jesus. So point number one here is who I was before Jesus, I was dead. Everybody say, I was dead. But now because of Jesus, say it, I'm alive. Let's cheer for that. We are alive. Being alive sure beats the alternative, right? I'm thankful that I am alive. But before Jesus, spiritually, I was dead. And then the day I met Jesus, he made me alive in him. And see, there's a glorious exchange that takes place at the moment of salvation. When we say yes to Jesus, Jesus exchanged our sin for his life. And because of this, he replaced God's wrath 
for mercy, his punishment for grace. This is the best news for us. This is a fundamental principle for us to understand is that this glorious exchange took place. That what Jesus did for us on the cross is what made us alive, what satisfied the wrath of God in order for us to receive his grace and mercy. You see, without Jesus dying on the cross, again, this is, these are the basics. And if you understand these things, this is a refresher of the basics. We were by nature children of wrath, just as everybody else, until we met Jesus. The second principle that we read, we see this in verse, beginning in verse 4, it says, but God, I I love but God moments. But God, I was dead, and I was lost, and I was completely out of my element, but God. The best testimony we could ever have begins with that. But God, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our sin, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So be who I am because of Jesus now is that I'm alive. Who I was before Jesus, I was dead in my sin, and who I am because of Jesus, now I am made alive in him. My favorite verse in Ephesians is in verse 8. It says, for for by grace you have been saved through faith. Not of yourself, it is a gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let me just tell you what grace is. See, grace is this. It's the disposition to or an act or an instance of kindness, courtesy, clemency, mercy, pardon, temporary exemption. It's, It's something that we don't deserve because of our actions. It's kindness. So what is grace? There are 131 uses of grace in the Bible, 124 of them in the New Testament. And Paul, the apostle, he's considered the apostle of grace. This is his message. This is the thread throughout his letters is that by grace we have been saved. Well, let me just help you take it a step further. Grace has a name. And his name is Jesus. By grace, we've been saved. We could substitute that word and say, by Jesus, we have been saved. Titus, he puts it really Really, he just words it so well in, in Titus 2. He says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. This is talking about Jesus. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearance of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. You see, whatever, any time we think that the I had, a, I had a friend of mine tell me that this is a dead instrument. The Bible is a dead instrument. <laughs> I'm like, well, apparently you, you don't read it. Because if you did read it, you would understand that it is not a dead instrument. And what happens when we read things like Titus, we can place ourselves in the just... Just all we have to do is look at what he's talking about here and think about the day and age that we live in right now. You see, if it was a dead instrument, then it would not be relevant to today. But it is. Denying ungodliness and worldly lust. You see a little bit of that today? 
that we should live soberly and righteously and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Man, this is, this is probably the best news for us ever is that Jesus came on the scene to rescue us, to redeem us out of a world that was just lost to themselves. The world that we see right now is lost to itself. Lost to its lustful desires, lost to its wants, lost to its every whim. Lost to its own truth. How many times have we heard, man, you just, you just do you, man. You just live your truth. And I've, I've heard that so many times, it, just, it makes you sick. You see, when you live your own truth, it's because you don't know what the truth is. So your only alternative is to live your truth. I don't know what the truth is, but so I'm going to make something up in my head that sounds good. And I'm going to do that. And this happens over and over and over again. And society keeps doing this. We feel like we're in a free fall right now. This is where the church has to come in and rise up and share the truth, tell the truth, speak the truth. When we hear people say, when we hear people say, I'm going to live my truth. I'm going to say, well, does your truth line up with the truth? Because if it doesn't, then it, it, it's not worth its weight. Save your breath. It goes on to say in verse 11, it says, Therefore, remember that you were once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands. That at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far off have been, bought, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And so the last thing here is uh, point number three is who I am now with Jesus. I'm at peace with God. For he himself, verse 14, for he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and to those who are near. Let me just explain what the word enmity is. Enmity comes from the Latin word enemicus. It literally means the opposite of friend. It means unfriend. Unfriend. And so when we unfriend, Anybody ever get unfriended on Facebook? You know, I never find out I get unfriended by somebody until, you know, like a year later, I get a new friend request from the same person that I thought we were friends with, you know? Ever have that happen? You're like, wait, I thought we were friends. When did you defriend me? I'm a, was this something that I said? When we have enmity with the Lord, we have unfriended him. And not just on social media. It's saying that we are in exact contradiction. We are in opposition of who God is. And because of this enmity, the only way to rectify this enmity that we had, this enemy that we had in God, was because of what Jesus, Jesus had to come on the scene in order to satisfy the wrath of God, in order, us, in order for us to be now friends with God. This is our hope. This is what we cling to. 
that Jesus came to this world for you and I to save us so that we would no longer have enmity between us and our Creator, that we would have fellowship and friendship between us and God. You see, Romans 8, 7 says, it talks about the mind that is set on the, fle- on the flesh is hostile to God. Or in James 4, 4, it says, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? So when I read stuff like this, that, w- that because before Jesus that I had enmity with God, man, it really takes, it makes me take a, a good look in the mirror of how many times I have been an enemy of God. And you know, I could allow my brain and my head to go to the place where I'm like, you know what, I'm just not friends with the Lord. But I love what it says in Ephesians, but God who is rich in mercy and love, even when I was his enemy, He still loved me. Our hope is so great. Even when we do things to put separation between us and our Heavenly Father, He still loves us. He still chases after us. He still wants us to be in His family. See, what I need you to understand here is that whether you were born into Christianity or not. What, what defined you as this passage here described, either Jew or Gentile? Jesus did something incredible for us. And, and I actually, let me just read this again here in verse 14. It says, for he himself, he is our peace who has made both one, who has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished his flesh, the enmity that is the law of the commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from two, making peace. Peace with God. You see, when we identify with God, Christ, when we are in Him, we are at peace with Him. See, there's enough in the world right now that's just creating all kinds of chaos, turmoil, all kinds of things that would disrupt our peace. And we have a Savior here that is offering Himself for us as a redeemer for us to be at peace with our creator. To me, this is the greatest hope that I could ever hold on to, is that it's nothing that I could do of myself, no works that I could boast. There's nothing that I can do to earn his love. There's nothing that I could, no works that I could do that would bring me to be more saved. It is solely by the grace of God when I believe in that Jesus being the savior of the world wants to know me and wants to be in a relationship with me he calls me his own I love what it says in Galatians 3 it says so in Christ Jesus you're all children of God through faith For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. And there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. We're one with Him. There's no more enmity because of sin or because of religion. We are at peace with Him. And I love this. (laughs) <laughs> Jana says something really funny about churches that sometimes we think like churches are like street gangs that we're at odds with each other that we fight with one another 
that when we see one another out in public, we don't want to acknowledge each other. But let me just say, we are all one. We are all one. And what makes us one is that we're citizens of heaven. And this is who I am now. My identity is not found in any earthly thing. I am a citizen of heaven. This is what it says. This is how the chapter wraps up. For through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now, therefore, we are, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom also we are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit and we are one in him. So when we identify with him, when we identify with Christ Jesus, we are a citizen of heaven. So here's what... We have some responsibilities as a citizen of, of heaven. We gotta fear the Lord. We gotta depend fully on him. We've gotta trust the Lord. We gotta obey the Lord. We've got to love the Lord. And we've gotta focus on the eternal, not the things that are happening right now and right here. See, we get caught, so caught up in everything that's happening around us. We get so incensed sometimes. And I have to remind myself even that my citizenship is not of here. That my citizenship is in heaven. And because of that, my king, my president is King Jesus. King Jesus is on the throne. He is the one that's in control. He is the one that is, that is gonna take care of all this. This doesn't mean that we should be naive to what's happening in the world around us. But I do believe that this is the hope that we carry, is that it's not about here and now, but it's about what's coming. The kingdom of heaven, my citizenship is yet to come. I love what C.S. Lewis says. He says, I have come home at last. This is my real country. I belong here. This land that I have been looking for all my life, though I never knew it till now. Come further up. Come further in. This sounds truly like identity in Christ and citizenship in him that we have come home. So when we now identify in Christ, he is our identity. He is the one whose image that we bear. He is the one who calls us his own. He is the one who forgives us. He is the one who redeemed us. He is the one who saves us. He is the one who is our peace. He is our mediator. He is our king. So when we ask about identity, we can say with confidence that my identity is firmly rooted in Christ. And my citizenship is in heaven. Will you stand with me today? This idea of being rooted and established and being in Christ. The foundation piece of our faith. And you may find yourself today where you just, you don't know if you are in Christ. I want today to be the day that you decide, that you choose for yourself who you will serve. Will you serve, will you serve the, the things of the world or will you serve the Lord? Will you be in yourself or will you be in him? I believe that the Lord is calling each and every one of us here to be in Him. But if you find yourself in a place where you're not, I want to invite you today to take a step of faith and enter in to the presence of Christ Jesus, to be in Him. It's so simple for us to do that. It's just saying, Lord, I believe in you. Today I'm confessing with my mouth my need for you. 
I'm repenting of my past and I'm thanking you for paying the price for my past, present, and future sin. And today I'm confessing that you are Lord of my life. You bow your heads with me today. Lord Jesus, today I thank you. I thank you for giving us a new name, a new identity, that we will be found in you. And so, Father, today, as we accept you as our Lord and Savior, Lord, I pray that you would just make your presence known in our life. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for dying on the cross for our sin. And today we repent, we confess, and we turn. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if there's somebody in this room, maybe you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you've never made a profession of faith. Maybe, or maybe you did a long time ago, but you just have been living your life however you wanted to live. And today is the day you say, you know what, I'm no longer going to live how I want to live, but I'm going to live according to your plan, Lord Jesus. If you're in this room here today, he hears you, he sees you, and he knows your heart. So just confess your need to him today. We just do that through a simple prayer. And you can repeat after me or you can say it however you want to. Again, there's nothing magical about repeating a prayer, but what, there, what is significant is that you truly believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord of your life. So if that's you in this room, just pray with me. Lord Jesus, today I'm confessing my need for you. I wanna make you Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me. I'm believing in my heart and I'm confessing with my mouth that you died on the cross and that you rose again and you are now called my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for hearing my prayer, in Jesus' name. There's no one looking around. If there's anybody in this room, maybe you prayed for the very first time, or maybe you just wanna recommit your life to the Lord, would you just raise your hand and say, that was me today. Thank you. I see you in the back. Thank you, Lord. Anybody else? For those of you that are raising your hands, here is step number two. First is, is confessing your need. For the second is what the Bible calls the great command, is that is to be baptized. So we have a baptism coming up here in, in very, very shortly. And we would love to celebrate your decision for making Jesus Christ Lord of your life and telling the world that Jesus Christ is your Lord through baptism. And so the way we do this is you're gonna to have to let us know that you made a decision today. So if, if you would grab the card that's in the seat pocket in front of you, just fill it out. Just say, I prayed with Pastor Dan, I would like to be baptized and we'll take care of the rest. We'll get a hold of you for, for our next scheduled baptism. And we wanna celebrate what the Lord has done in your life. Amen. Hey, I saw at least four people raise their hands today. Can we give the Lord a hand for that this morning? Today's a great day. The angels are celebrating when we place our faith in Jesus. Scripture says that there's a party going on in heaven, and I love that. So let's celebrate that one more time. Thank you, guys. Thank you.